This is a diagram of what we call an electrostatic precipitator. It's designed to filter out pollutants from air. Yesterday, I was down in my furnace room in the basement of my house to change the furnace filter. That's a mechanical furnace filter. When particles of dust and other pollutants are in the air, they come down from the cold air vent in your bedroom or the living room or whatever. They go down through the furnace, through this filter, and they get pump, heated up and then pumped back up through the hot air vents in the, your bedroom or the living room or the kitchen or wherever. This filter takes out pollutants and dirt and dust particulates from the air. But that's a, it's a positive thing. I mean, yesterday when I changed that, I can see the dirt. I can literally see the dirt that's been filtered out of the air that's been circulating through my house. That's a positive thing. But it is limited in the size of the particles that it can filter out because of the mechanical nature of it. If you have a filter, a mechanical filtering system, then it's going to filter out a certain size particle and bigger. If you get a particle that's too small, it's going to end up going right through. If we have a system that's something like this, an electrostatic precipitator, then the size of the particle isn't really relevant. We can filter out much, much smaller particles. Over here we have a fan. And this fan blows air through this system. It blows air pre-filtered air through this system. So in other words, air that has the pollutants. It may have gone through a mechanical filtration system already, or it may not have gone through this mechanical filtration system. Bottom line is, there's still pollutants. These pollutants are neutral. These neutral pollutants end up touching a negatively charged rod. These rods become negatively charged because there's a battery or a power supply down here that has touching or connected to these rods the negative terminal. This is the symbol for battery. You're going to see that a lot this year. The small side is the negative side. The long side is the positive. You can see in this diagram that the small side or the negative side is touching these blue rods. So that makes these blue rods negative. Now, the other side, the positive side of the battery, is touching these red plates. That makes these red plates positive. As these neutral pollutants go through the negatively charged rod and rub up against these negatively charged rod, these neutral pollutants become what? Negative, yeah. Negative by conduction or induction. Conduction or induction? Who says it's conduction? Who says induction? This would be conduction. Because as these things rub up against them, electrons will transfer from the negatively charged rod to the neutral pollutants. When we have electrons transferring, that's conduction. Got it? Electrons transferring, that's conduction. So these neutral pollutants become negative by conduction. Now, these blue little balls here are the same ones that went through, the same ones that were neutral, but now they're negatively charged because they've been charged by conduction as they rub up against these negatively charged rods. Now they go through these red positively charged plates. What happens to them now? Negative pollutants, positively charged plates. What happens to these negatively charged pollutants? Yeah, yeah they're attracted to these positively charged plates. So. They get attracted. They stick to these positively charged plates. What goes out the other side? What comes out the other side over here? Air, clean air. The negatively charged pollutants that were neutral pollutants have been attracted to the positively charged plates. And what's left to go out the other side? The neutral air going out the other side. The clean air, I should say, going out the other side. Okay. That's a better way of filtering air than a mechanical system, but it's, it's, it's technically a lot more difficult than, a lot more complicated than a mechanical system as well. Here's another one. This is uh, what uh, will hopefully be my backyard after I win 649 this Wednesday night. Okay. Um, backyard with my pool, my wrought iron fence, the ocean in the background. I'll send you a postcard on Thursday after I win on Wednesday. 
Yeah, you, right now, you don't believe me, but when I win, you, get this, you guys all get that postcard. Okay, I'm going to have the last laugh. My fence needs a paint job, scratched up a little bit. I don't want to take out the paintbrush and paint it because that's going to take a long time to paint all those, all those uh, pieces of the wrought iron fence there. So what I'm going to do is spray it. But I also don't want to spray the, the pool deck because that's just going to make a mess. I don't want to spray the water, get any excess spray on the water because that's going to just make a mess of the water. It's also going to clog up the filtration system of the pool. So what I want to do is spray it but come up with a system that creates a lot less mess. So I'm going to use an electrostatic painting system. There's a bucket of paint down here, a black paint down here. And then there's an air compressor that will pump this paint through, these, through this uh, paint nozzle here, through this, this paint gun here. Kind of like, it's kind of like you know, when you take one of those little cans and you shake it up and it goes a tiny little mist, right? That's what happens here, except it gets pushed through by this air compressor as opposed to this, this propellant that's in the little paint can. In this paint gun is a little rod. That rod could be negatively charged or positively charged. We'll make it negative this time. As these paint particles get pushed through this gun, get pushed past this negatively charged rod, they become charged. What do they become charged? Positive or negative? Neutral paint, negatively charged rod. They become negative. If it was a positively charged rod, the paint would become positive, right? doesn't really matter. They're charged. So neutral paint has become negative. By what? Conduction or induction? That would be conduction, right? We've transferred charge from the negative rod to the neutral paint to make them both neutral, negative or from the positive rod, um, sorry, from the, from the paint, the neutral paint to the positive rod to make them both positive. Bottom line is they come out charged. In this case, negatively charged. They're attracted to this metal fence and they stick to this metal fence as a result of this electrostatic attraction. Now we also get a charge build up there, right? But look at this fence. It's a touching. Yeah, so it's touching the ground. It's grounded. So you don't end up getting any real charge build up because it's already grounded. Now take a look at this from above here. Here's our paint gun. We're spraying out the paint towards this object. This paint, regardless of whether it's electrostatic or not, would strike the front of this object and it would cover it, right? This paint wouldn't. This paint would miss. So what's happening now? It's elect yeah, normally that would be overspray. It would make a mess of my pool deck. It would also make a mess of the pool. But now it gets attracted electrostatically to the fence post. So now I get a lot more coverage, right? This serves two purposes. One, it's environmental, right? Why is it environmental? Because you get a lot less paint into the environment, right? It's not going into the water. You don't get paint particles going into the ocean. You're not getting paint particles going into the ground and affecting the groundwater. And two, it saves a lot of money, right? If you look at, if you look at normal paint, you get this much hitting the object. If you look at this, you're getting essentially three times the amount of paint actually striking the object, which means less harm on the environment, but also less harm on your pocketbook because you're getting three times the coverage. Does that make sense? They paint cars like this. Why do you think they paint cars like this? It gives you more even coverage, but what's the big reason? It's cheaper. Yeah, it, it, it costs less because you can get two or three times the amount of coverage out of the paint that you otherwise could. You don't get the wastage. All right. Now, I want to take a look at one more thing and then we'll give you a little break here, okay? This is new. It's still an application, I guess, but the term is new. An electroscope is a device that detects electric charge. We have the electroscopes in the back room there. They don't work very well, and that's why I don't bother bringing them out and have you play with them, because you don't end up seeing what you want to see. 
But in theory, an electroscope, a good electroscope, not the cheap things that we have in the back there, a good electroscope will detect charge. It doesn't tell you directly how much charge you have, and it certainly doesn't tell you what type of charge you have, but it does tell you whether you have charge or not. An electroscope consists of, and they look a little bit different, but it consists of basically some kind of box or cylinder to shield from air currents, consists of a metal rod with a metal ball on the top of it, and then either a couple metallic balls at the bottom, or in this case, both of these cases, a couple sheets of really, really thin foil at the bottom of it. We're not talking like aluminum foil, like tin foil you have in your house. We're talking like way thinner than that. Really, really, really thin. So that's, in essence, what they always look like. Now, how does it detect charge? Well, let's draw it again here, where we have a little bit more space. Let's say this electroscope is neutral. So equal number of pauses and negatives. And you can see that they're all more or less evenly distributed through here, right? Now, what happens if I bring a negatively charged object nearby? What happens to the protons in this, in this electroscope? The quick answer to that question, you know it. Nope, nothing. What happens to the protons? Nothing. Why? Yeah, they're stuck in the nucleus. They don't move around. What happens to the electrons, Parker? Good. They're going to be pushed away. So we had one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. We're still going to have six electrons, but now there's going to be a higher percentage of them far away from this charging object, the green charging object. In other words, they go down into the leaves of the electroscope. Now, what does the ball of the electroscope become? A positive. What do the leaves of the electroscope become? Negative. Now, what's going to happen to these leaves as a result of them both being negatively charged? They're going to repel each other. Negative repels negative. So it's now going to look something like this. Does that make sense? We just detected charge. Does it tell us how much charge we have? No, although the more charge you have, the more they will spread apart. Has it told us what type of charge we have? No. Positive, negative. All we know is that it's charge. Let's take a look at another diagram here. Again. Equal number of positives and negatives. Bring a negatively, sorry, a positively charged object nearby this time. Positive object nearby. What happens to the protons? Nothing. They stay where they are, right? What happens to the electrons? They move up. Yeah. They get pulled up into the ball of the electroscope. So instead of having six scattered around, we're going to have a higher concentration of them up here. The ball of the electroscope becomes negative. The leaves of the electroscope become positive. So what happens to the leaves as they're both positive? They spread apart because positive repels positive. So the effect, the macroscopic effect of this, when we look at this, you know, like just with the naked eye, we look at this, we see that the leaves spread apart in both cases. We can see that there's charge present in this charging object that's brought nearby. But the electroscope doesn't look any different from, from our perspective in either case. So we don't know what type of charge it is. We just know that it's charge in one type or another. What do you think would happen if I grounded this. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this before, we, before you answer that question. It doesn't matter where I put the grounding wire, left side, right side, top, bottom. Okay? It doesn't matter where I put the grounding wire. 
If I ground this, the same thing is going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? Yes. You think the negatives get pushed down here, so then maybe it sucks negatives up, right? But it doesn't. It pushes negatives down as far away as it can push them. That means that instead of pushing them down into the leaves of the electroscope, it ends up pushing the negatives down this way into the ground. The leaves of the electroscope now become positive. So what happens to them? Sorry? They, they stay spread apart, right? By the way, if I cut this ground wire, what do you think is going to happen? They're kind of trapped that way, right? We say it's a permanent separation then. It's permanent because they stay that way. They don't stay that way forever because realistically, electrons will discharge from the air into the leaves and cause them to come back together eventually. But for the next little while, they're going to stay spread apart without our intervention. What do you think is going to happen if we put a ground wire in the bottom one? Again, it doesn't matter which side. Let's put it down here if we want. Yeah. You're going to get, ele get electrons coming up. And at some point, you've got so many electrons up here in the ball of the electroscope, some of them start filtering down. The leaves become negative. You get more up at the ball of the electroscope, but some of them still filter down into the leaves. The leaves become negative, and they spread apart. And they stay spread apart as long as you cut the ground wire. Don't memorize that. Okay, don't memorize all the different scenarios of, okay, if I bring a positive nearby and I don't ground it, if I bring a negative nearby and I do ground it, like, don't remember that stuff. If you understand what I've just said, then figure it out come test time. Because reality is, like, you know, maybe you're given a question with an electroscope, maybe you're given a question with an electrostatic precipitator, maybe you're given some other question in some other context that you've never seen before. If you understand what we've done here today, then you should be able to work through any question you get. If you haven't memorized, but rather you've understood what we've done. All right?